Hey everyone, welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. I'm Adam and the focus of our lecture today is on sign language acquisition. So previously in our last lecture, we had just considered spoken language acquisition. So now we're gonna consider sign language acquisition. The reason that we're gonna consider both spoken languages and sign languages is because both are natural languages. It's very easy to sort of, when we think about languages, to go to the language that is most common to us, right? For me, it's English. Maybe for you, it's Spanish, French, or German. But in many cases, we just automatically think of language in terms of um, its spoken varieties. Um, you may even hear language defined in terms of its spoken form, right? So very importantly, the goal for today is to acknowledge that sign languages are also a genuine form of natural language. Also, it's gonna highlight the fact that there's something cognitive important for us to understand cognitively about both spoken languages and sign languages, okay? Regardless of whether our linguistic system is a spoken or a sign, our, our linguistic system as a linguistic system is gonna retain some of the core properties, okay? Hockett calls these properties design features of language, right? And essentially the important thing is that there's certain features of language that all languages have insofar as they're full-fledged natural languages, okay? And I want us to be clear that these design features of language are also evidenced in sign languages. Okay, I think this topic is fascinating, and there's many varieties of sign language. The one that we're going to use as an entry point for this course is Nicaraguan Sign Language. So for today, we looked at two articles on NSL or Nicaraguan Sign Language. This is the first one that we looked at for today. It's called Children Creating Core Properties of Language by Senghas, Kita, and Azurek. Okay, some of the major players, the major figures and scholars in this field. Okay. All right, so like spoken languages, sign languages are genuine natural languages with what Charles Hockett called design features of language. Okay, Charles Hockett outlined a list of design features other scholars have added to this list. So we won't, the purpose of today is not to go through all the, the list of all the design features, but just to point out the two that are of importance, of central importance for the article for today, okay? Two of the design features that we are focusing on today include the following. The first is discreteness or the basic elements of the, this refers to the fact that the basic elements of language are perceived categorically rather than continuously. And we saw this in the last lecture, how when we adjust VOT or voice onset time, right, it went from pa to ba, right? It, although the change was continuous using the computer, our perception of the sound change from pa to ba was categorical, right? We also, when we looked at syntax tree diagrams, we made the important point that we don't just see a string of words, but we see different units or different word types, right? That represent different categories like noun, phrase, verb, phrase. And the nice thing about having categories like noun, phrase, or verb, phrase is that we can substitute like elements for like elements, right? Noun phrases can be substituted for other noun phrases and verb phrases can be substituted for other verb phrases. Okay, so you see that having discreteness, right? There's a distinction between uh, NP and VP, right? And also the fact that they're categorical really helps with what we've discussed before as the systematicity of language, okay? The, um, that when I grasp a sentence form, I like dogs. I can also now use that structural form to un understand other utterances like, I love dogs or I hate tests or other things that fit that those categorical slots, okay? So that's the first design feature that we're looking at today. The second one is categorical or combinatorial, sorry, combinatorial patterning, 
Okay. You can think as this is related to the productive nature of language, right? We saw before how syntax is really cool because we see the possibility of um, infinitely recursive applications, right? Um, I know that he knows that I know that he knows that I know, right? We saw um, the, the possibility of embedding uh, that clauses under the VP. We also saw the possibility of embedding prepositional phrases under the NP, right? And so that's what's meant by combinatorial patterning, the fact that uh, the basic elements of language are organized in the principled hierarchical faction, right? Like in a tree sort of structure, right? And we saw that these are awesome design features of language since they enable us to be both systematic, right? And productive with our language. So the goal for today is to expand our knowledge of language more generally by considering sign languages in particular, right? This is to flag the point that not all languages are spoken languages. The, and an interesting idea when we get later in the course, when we focus on evolution, uh, we might ask, right? Is the evolutionary basis of language is a more compelling story told from the vocal point of view or from the manual point of view, right? It could be the case that language evolved either um, vocally, right? Uh, the driving force may be uh, vocal or it may be gestural, right? So it's nice to have these different possibilities, right? To think of language in all of its variety because it may be the case that the evolutionary basis for language is grounded in one or the other, okay? So a little bit of background about NSL. Uh, Nicaraguan Sign Language, or NSL, began to develop in Nicaragua in the late 1970s and 1980s due to the opening of public schools. It wasn't that NSL was explicitly taught in these schools. The important thing that public schools provide a social venue or area in which um, individuals in the community can connect and communicate with each other. Okay, so before the 70s and 80s, um, deaf Nicaraguan children and adults had little contact with each other. So the opening of public schools at this time provided more opportunities for individuals to connect and communicate. Okay. At this time, right, there's social issues and just practical issues that prevent the interaction and um, discourse among uh, deaf individuals, okay. Although school was taught to deaf children in Spanish, the first group of deaf children began to develop a new gestural system for communication, right? And you can sort of understand the motivation for deaf children beginning to develop a gestural system to communicate. It's because the primary language in which they were instructed was spoken Spanish. Right, but you can see that clearly this is not ideal for deaf children, right? Why would you teach um, deaf children in uh, spoken Spanish when they're deaf, right? And, and we have to sort of situate this in the time and just understand that at this time, there was an urge or a motivation to try to get deaf people to read lips, right? And, and in some sense, try to participate as much as possible with the spoken language communities, okay? Um, we've made some great progress socially since then, understanding that sign languages are legitimate languages, and therefore there's nothing inferior about sign languages, right? And with the increasing understanding of sign languages as legitimate languages, there's also been a shift from imposing spoken languages on deaf children and now just teaching deaf children sign languages, okay? So another important thing we see, um, I'm gonna try to connect these dots whenever I can, right? We see that being in the position of a cognitive scientist is very helpful in helping to inform proper useful uh, pedagogy, okay? Do not <laughs> force deaf children to learn primarily in a spoken language if the uh, sign language is more readily available for them. Okay, they're gonna be able to learn and progress academically um, and socially much better in that case, okay? Okay, 
So um, we saw that when these schools first opened, it was great in the sense that it provided a forum and a public space for individuals to begin communicating with each other, right? But it wasn't a perfect situation since it's not like they were being taught NSL in school, right? They were being, they were being instructed in Spanish and the first group, right? Like the first kids, the first cohort, if you will, that studied in this school, you can see that they're gonna be creating right, a very rudimentary gestural basis of communication. It's not sign language just yet, as we'll see, but over subsequent generations of new children being introduced to this language as they enter school, right, we'll see that it will develop into a full-fledged genuine sign language, okay? And it's this sort of evolution of language which is really awesome and noteworthy for us as cognitive scientists, okay? So although Nicaraguan Sign Language or NSL developed from a more basic system of gestural communication, we also want to importantly distinguish between sign language and gesture, okay? In many lectures, even provided by professors, right? Distinguished professors that are very intelligent in cognitive science and linguistics, sometimes this point is not appreciated, okay? Sign language is not the same as gesture, okay? I wanna emphasize that. Sign language, although it's rooted in the hands and it's a gestural uh, kind of communication, sign language is not just gesture. And we'll use the lecture today to get clear on what the distinction is between sign languages and gestures. So, whereas sign languages, sign languages are fully structured natural languages that display the common design features of language, right, Hockett's design features, right, gestures and home signs, in contrast, are not fully structured natural languages that display the common design features of language, okay, so it's sort of semantically baked into the words, right? NSL, ASL, all these SLs, all these sign languages are languages. And in virtue of their linguistic status, they have to include those design features of language, okay? They need to have um, um, cat a combinatorial patterning. They need to have um, the other one was discreteness. Another way to think about this is we need what we need from these languages is systematicity and productivity, okay? It's crucial for any language, including the SLs or the sign languages, okay? Importantly, gestures, home signs, they're not full-fledged languages. They're gonna be missing some of these design features of language. A home sign, a gesture, is not gonna have some of these other properties like combinatorial patterning or discreteness, right? It may have, you know, one or the other. The thing is, it's not gonna have the set or the collection of important features in virtue of which we classify something as a genuine language, okay? Home signs or communication systems that are built out of common gestures that are used at home with family members, okay? But home signs do not exhibit the complex linguistic properties of full natural languages, okay? So there's a relationship between gesture and home sign, okay? A gesture is holistic and in some sense iconic, right? Um, home signs are a category of gesture, right? It's a type of gesture that's used for communicating at home. Or, I mean, the, the point about home sign is it doesn't have to be literally in your home, but that you use it in that sort of home style environment with your family, okay? Excuse me. I think this is a, an excellent way to understand the distinction between home sign and sign language, okay? Home signers, they have gestures or signs for things, right? Like they have a sign for dog, right? But home signs are idiosyncratic to each individual's home environment. Whereas sign language is a public thing, right? If we both speak English or we both speak ASL, we use the same sign or word for dog, 
right? Since we both speak English, when I say dog, I mean a certain thing. And when you say dog, you mean that same certain thing. So that's how we understand what we mean when we communicate is because we're sharing in the same communicative linguistic currency, right? I use the same word as you do to refer to items in the world, okay? Dogs, for example, okay? So language, right, whether it's spoken or signed is a social public phenomena, right? It exists publicly and individuals have to coordinate and partly map or agree in that public usage, right? Home sign is different in that with home signs, there isn't sort of a standardized public meaning for a, a sign. In my home, I might have an idiosyncratic sign for dog. Like maybe I do this for dog, right? Cause I'm, the ears are very salient on, on my dog. But maybe for at your home, your home sign is something like this, right? Like maybe you're doing like a tail wagging thing. Okay, maybe your dog has short ears and a long tail, and my dog has long ears and a short tail. So given our idiosyncratic home environments, we develop idiosyncratic home signs to communicate at home. Okay, so for all practical purposes, like that might work, like me doing this at home with my parents may work sufficiently well to communicate what I need to communicate about my pet. Okay, and similarly in the other home situation or home environment, the tail wagging version of that sign may work just as well for the other home environment, okay? So with home signs, you can sort of go through different home environments and find idiosyncratic signs for a referent. But when we get to a sign language, we have to become more in uniform agreement, right, with our signs, okay? So you'll see that when people, when children, deaf children, move from the home environment and start going to school, right? They're gonna start trading um, some of their home signs for um, real sign language symbols, okay? Another way to think about that is there's gonna be some disagreement, right? Between the home sign they were using for dog and the conventional social usage, right? In NSL. So due to that disagreement, they're gonna give up the home sign version and adopt the conventional version, right? The one that's in use in the community. And the important thing about the community-ness of the sign, right, of NSL, is not that it's being dictated or taught from adults, but that that group is in agreement in their usage, okay? So we'll see that uh, one of the things we wanna to explore today is whether, right, the structure in NSL is taught from adults to the kids, in some sense imposed from elders to the, to the youth, or whether it's the kids that are creating the, the structure in NSL, okay? And it could be that just the kids through subsequent generations are creating this together, right, as they use sign language together, okay? Okay, so I hope that that made it very clear the distinction between language and gesture, right? Uh, gesture, um, gesture and home sign are gonna be related and language is gonna be a little bit different because language has the design features, okay? Gesture and home sign are gonna be missing those features, okay? Another thing to point out here is that uh, gestures tend to be more iconic and holistic right? So uh, notice that my gesture for dog is sort of like one thing that may look like a dog, right? And my gesture for the sun may be like, I might make an icon that resembles the thing that I'm trying to refer to, okay? So with the icons and, and with the gestures, they're more iconic. And I'm in some sense trying to use my body to create a picture of the thing that I want to point out. Okay, I'm in some sense just using my body as a single holistic picture to pick out the thing that I want to refer you to. Okay, but notice that that's not how we use language. We don't use language um, iconically or in that sort of holistic way, but rather we break things down into component parts, right? So that way we can recombine them. Okay, so when I talk about the sun or about my dog, I don't just use like blah, like one 
picture verbally, but I break it down into component parts, right? Like the dog is wagging his tail, right? It, I'm putting, using pieces to paint that picture linguistically, right? You see, it's different. I'm not doing one thing like, huh, right? I'm using words like the dog has uh, flappy ears, okay? And in, in order for it to be linguistic, I have to have these categorical items that I can combine to paint that linguistic picture, if you will, okay? So importantly, this is the distinction between languages and gestures and signs, all right. So to be super clear on these points, I just provided a slide here to give us some examples that clearly break this down, okay? So natural language systems include the first variety is uh, natural spoken languages, right? Spanish, English, French, okay? But natural language systems also include natural sign languages. For example, Nicaraguan sign language, American sign language, and French sign language, okay? Importantly, the sign languages are not derived from the spoken languages, but they're their own genuine generated languages. Okay. Interestingly enough, ASL has more in common with um, LSF or French sign language than ASL has in common with English. Okay. What I'm trying to say here is because of the his this historical progression, right? Um, ASL, American Sign Language, partly originated from um, um, LSF or French Sign Language, because one of the instructors of French Sign Language moved to the United States to begin teaching uh, sign languages in the United States, okay? And so one of the first teachers of ASL was French, so there's a borrowing um, or a, an influence of LSF on ASL, okay? So there's actually a lot of commonalities between LSF and ASL, right? More so than the connection between ASL and English, right? You might think, ah, well, you know, ASL is just translating words from English to sign language. And that's absolutely not what's going on, right? There is not a sort of isomorphism from English words to ASL words, right? There is not sort of a one-to-one -one transfer from the spoken language to the sign language, okay? So they're both genuine languages, but not in virtue of the relation to each other, in virtue of them sharing the properties that linguistic systems have, those design features or core features of language, okay? And then we're just distinguishing this class of natural language systems from non-linguistic forms of communication, right? There's many other ways to communicate that are non-linguistic, right? We can use gestures, we can paint, we can do lots of other, we can engage in lots of other forms of communication. So uh, two that we looked at today were gestures, which are an iconic but non-linguistic form of communication, as well as home signs, which are a non-linguistic gesture-based communication system used among family members at home, okay? Remember, natural languages have design features, whereas home signs and other non-linguistic gestures do not. Cool, moving right along. Across both articles on, LS, on NSL for today, we're interested in investigating whether these awesome design features of language are due to older adults or due to younger children, right? Since we see NSL developing in Nicaragua and we see that NSL is, um, the NSL has these design features of language, the question is this, where did those features come from? Why does NSL have those design features of language? Is it because of adults, right? Um, introducing those and teaching those to children or is it because of the children sort of imposing those on the language? Okay. If um, children simply learn or memorize the syntax that adults teach them, this would seem to support the learning theory view of language from behaviorism that we've discussed. On the other hand, if children create new syntactic features while using language with each other, 
This would seem to support the universal grammar view of language from nativism, right? The alternative view that we've considered in earlier lectures. Okay, so once again, we see how questions about language acquisition and development are central to debates in cognitive science about the nature of mind. So let's compare the use of syntactic features in NSL across children and adults to see which group uses syntactic features the most, right? Are adults really using all these syntactic features in NSL or, or are kids using them, right? Which group is using syntactic features the most? This might, might give us some insight on where those features, syntactic features are coming from. So to be clear, if the first cohort and think about the first cohort as like the first group of kids that went to the school, right? These are gonna be then the older adults, right? If say there's three groups of three cohorts or three groups of kids that attend the school, the first group, the second group, the third group, clearly the first group, right, is gonna be older. The second group is gonna be younger and the third group is gonna be younger still, right? Um, so that's how I want you to understand what is meant by first, second, third cohort, okay? If the first cohort of older adults surpasses the second cohort of younger children in the use of syntactic features, then we can conclude that individuals with age and experience are responsible for developing the syntax of the language, okay? However, if the second cohort of younger children surpasses the first cohort of older adults in the use of syntactic features, then we can conclude that the newest learners are developing the language, going beyond the language, the language models that are provided by the adults, right? If the younger children are using more syntactic features than the adults, right? And they're using them in a more consistent, systematic way, then we know that their use is not dictated from the, the older adults, right? Because they're not, they're not following the model of language that's provided to them from the adults, right? In some sense, we, the adults are, are providing the kids with a impoverished stimulus, right? And we saw from earlier lecture, um, the poverty of the stimulus argument, right? That uh, from Chomsky, that we gotta have rules for language in our mind because what we get from the environment is impoverished, right? We get sort of junk input from the environment. And what we have to do as children is use our UG, universal grammar, to sort of tidy all that up, okay? Ah, this is all garbage coming in, but thanks to my highly organized system of linguistic knowledge, boom, I can start to put things in more systematic order, okay? So these are our sort of two uh, options that we're gonna explore today in this article. We're looking at two articles today. The first article, this article, is gonna focus on the expression of motion events in NSL by both children and adults, okay? So what's a motion event? Well, you can see in this fun little picture what a motion event is, right? Maybe it's a nice day outside and you wanna go out and roll down a hill, right? Or down a grass hill. Okay, well, that's a motion event, right? There is an event of you rolling down a grass hill, okay? So notice that in that one event, right? That's a single event, you rolling down the hill. However, this motion event includes both a manner of movement and a path of movement, okay? An example of a manner of movement is rolling, right? This could also be falling, right? You could be falling down a hill, um, rolling down the hill, right? Think about the different ways in which you could go down a hill, right? And that would indicate the manner in which you went down the hill, okay? Motion events also have a path of movement, right? So you're not only rolling down a hill, you're also rolling down a hill, right? So this has to do with the fact that we can roll down or maybe we, um, it's hard to imagine rolling up something, right? But maybe you're in a, another possible world, right? Philosophically, well, where you roll up a hill, right? Or maybe you're pulled up or dragged up a hill, okay? Um, the, the important point here is that for any motion event, we can think about both its manner and path, 
of movement, okay? Rolling, falling is manner. Um, upward, downward, right? Descending, ascending is the path, okay? Importantly, why I wanted you to see this fun picture first was that notice, importantly, that this motion event, right, the event in the world is simultaneous, right? It's not like this guy here is rolling first and then descending or descending first and then rolling, right? That would be really weird, right? What's going on here is he's rolling down the hill, okay? So the event in the world is, the motion event in the world is sort of simultaneously including manner and path, okay? So this is now our question in this article, okay? Do kids represent, do kids and adults, when they're communicating, do they express motion events either iconically, simultaneously, right? Like we see in A, or do they separate manner and path and discuss it sequentially, right? As it would, as is indicated in B. Okay, the most direct way to iconically represent that motion event would be to represent manner and path simultaneously, right? You see that since this event has manner and path simultaneously included in that event, that the most straightforward way to represent that event is to also create a gesture that has both manner and path simultaneously included, okay? And we see what's really cool in the NSL and this NSL gesture is that this adult is representing, right, with their right hand, both manner and path simultaneously, okay? We see the path is going in this direction, and then the manner is this, okay? So we see that it's possible to iconically represent motion events simultaneously, um, with this gesture, okay? However, notice that in natural language, when I'm speaking in English, when I'm talking about rolling down the hill, when I'm providing you with that linguistic information, notice that it went in sequence, right? I gave you the example, rolling down the hill, right? Rolling came first, down came second. Notice that it did not come simultaneously. That's the important thing. That with language, we're doing things sequentially, right? Boom, boom, boom. And then we're organizing it, okay? So in B, figure B demonstrates an example of how you would represent a motion event, not simultaneously, but sequentially, okay? So again, whereas in A, the path and the manner are combined in this one motion. Here, they're teased apart, right? We have first over here on this side, we have the manner with the circular motion, and then we have the path, which is with this motion right here, okay? Just like when I use my words, right? Uh, rolling, right, down the hill, okay? Or I'm sorry, uh, roll, like um, the, the path and then the manner, okay? So uh, just like when I say rolling down the hill, we wanna break it up into parts, okay? And that's the important thing here, okay? And then if you're interested, we can always ask further questions. Like across sign languages, is this order always the same or is it different, right? Do some sign languages express manner and then path? Do others express path and manner? There's a lot of more nuanced questions we can always ask here. Okay. The important thing for today, though, is just to um, appreciate this distinction, right, between simultaneous manner and path to express a motion event or sequential manner and path to express a motion event. Okay. So in this study, Sengaskita and Azirek presented participants with an animated cartoon and then videotaped them telling its story to appear. Okay, so I may have you pr pretend you're my participants for the study. I'll show you a two minute cartoon, something like this, right? Where there's things going on, okay? Then you will be instructed to 
um, explain this cartoon to another person, another participant, right? And notice that by having you watch this cartoon and then just allowing you to explain the story to another participant, you're free to use gestures or sign language to, ex to express these motion events, right? So when I see this part of the cartoon, I'm free to choose how I convey this motion event to you. Right, either simultaneously with manner and path simultaneously or sequentially. Okay, it's up to me on how I do that. So that's what uh, Sengas and colleagues did in this study is they had adults as well as younger children, right? Different cohorts in the study um, watch a cartoon and then explain to someone else what's going on in the cartoon. Okay. Uh, deaf subjects were signing their narratives, and then there was coders that watched the, the that watched the deaf subjects and then recorded the number of times the deaf participants described the motion events, um, either using a simultaneous or sequential approach. Okay, either adopting a an approach like A or an approach like B. If subjects describe motion events with manner and path simultaneously, then their use is iconic. And if subjects describe motion events with manner and path sequentially, then their use is more linguistic, right? So our question is, which group represents motion sequentially or more linguistically? Is it the adults or the kids? So just to be clear, we had three cohorts in the study. Remember the first cohort is gonna be the oldest cohort. In some sense, they're the ones that graduate from school first, right? So they're the older ones. Um, and then the third cohort is going to be the youngest cohort, right? The youngest children, okay? And just for some dates, the first cohort, they were first exposed to NSL before 1984. The second cohort was first exposed to NSL between 1984 and 1993. And then the third cohort was first exposed to NSL after 1993. All right, so let's go ahead and take a moment and appreciate what's going on in this figure. Okay, so these are the results now, okay. So here we see that 100% of gestures expressed manner and path simultaneously, okay? Uh, one more thing I wanna add here is in the study, they also had uh, speakers, Spanish speakers, they also filmed the Spanish speakers um, as they use gestures um, during their speech, okay? So in addition to uh, the signers being pre presented the cartoon and then having to uh, describe this event using uh, signs or gestures, they also had a group of speakers, like Spanish speakers, uh, describe the cartoon as well. And the Spanish speakers were free to gesture naturally while they were speaking. Okay. So this is what we see as our, our interesting results. 100% of gestures expressed manner and path simultaneously. Okay, so we see that here. Here we see pro uh, proportion of expressions, right, and gestures. This says that 100% of gestures express manner and path simultaneously, okay? So what does that mean? Does that mean uh, gestures, they 100% of the time express manner and path simultaneously, okay? So when we have a Spanish speaker, right, uh, expressing a motion event, they're going to use iconic gestures, right? They're not going to, if, if you're a Spanish speaker and you're talking about rolling down the hill, as you talk about it, you're going to also use a hand motion that looks more like this, okay? You're not going to produce something that looks like this, right? No one uh, produced this as they were speaking about the, um, that event, right, that motion event. Okay, so that's what we mean here is that for gestures, they always integrate a manner and path 
In other words, they're always iconic, right? That's in some sense what we want from gestures is we need them to look like the thing that they're supposed to depict, okay? So this is uh, A is simultaneous, B, this over here shows uh, the sequential results, okay? So we see here, 100% of gestures were simultaneous, 0% were sequential, okay? So here we have 0%, okay? So very clear, right? That all our gestures are gonna be iconic using manner and path simultaneously, okay? And none of them are gonna be sequential. Okay, it's utterly bizarre, right, to go out and um, mime in a non depictive but rather sequential way. Okay, next, another interesting result, and, and it's helpful to look at these next four results sort of together, right? Um, it's going to help us understand sort of the, the developmental trajectory of um, in, increasing syntactic structure, right? So the next pair of results I want us to consider is this from co cohort one, right? I remember cohort one is the older group. So we see here that 70% of signs from cohort one expressed manner and path simultaneously, right? So from cohort one, these were signers, but the oldest signers, in some sense, like the first group to start working on the development of the sign, what would eventually be the sign language, right? And we see here that they're not, they're, their signs are no longer 100% iconic or depicted, right? But rather now, only 70% are, right? It's still um, a large number of the, the manuals that are produced are still uh, simultaneous in their expression of manner and path. Right. In other words, 70% of the manuals that are still produced are still gestures rather than signs. Okay. And here I'm just using the word manual as more of a more abstract uh, category, which could be classified as either gesture or sign, right? just something that I'm doing with my hands. Okay. So we see that when we go from speakers, Spanish speakers that co gesture to signers, but the um, the first group, the oldest signers, we see that there is a move, right, from all the manuals being gestures, simultaneous manner and path, um, expression of motion, to just a large number, right, 70% of motion events being expressed simultaneously with manner and path, okay? And over here, we see that about 30%. Um, from cohort one, right, from the same cohort are uh, making the sequential, right? They're starting to break down, right? The motion event into both a manner and a path, okay? So this is pretty cool. We see that there's some beginnings of this um, combinatorial patterning and discreteness here, okay? And the next result, which is very cool to see sort of in contrast with the previous pairs of results is that we see in cohort three, I'm just gonna jump to cohort three, okay? And we'll see that for cohort three, and this is sort of the youngest group, right? The, the, the last cohort, but this means the youngest kids going to school, right? We see that for cohort three, 30% of signs from this cohort expressed manner and path simultaneously, right? So the younger children are using iconic gestures even less, right? Whereas speakers, they always used iconic gestures to express motion events. And whereas cohort one, for the majority of the time, used iconic gestures to express motion events. Here we see that for cohort three, it's the minority of the time, right, that they're now using ge iconic gestures to simultaneously express manner and path in motion events, okay? So that's really cool. And here, I'm just using these very general numbers, 70%, 30%, because the figures here are not great, actually, right? Like, honestly, this is not ideal, like these error bars, right? This should be 
transparent so I can see exactly where, where the bottom ends of this whisker, right, uh, hangs out at. But since this is black, like I can't see how far down this goes exactly, right? So instead of worrying about sort of uh, this, right, this range right here, let's just be make it simple for today and also on the quiz. I just want you to sort of like trace your finger across and then give me, uh, give me the best selection, okay? The important thing is not like 73 versus 69% or whatever. The important thing is that we see like majority of the time this is happening for older adults, but the majority of the time something very different is happening for the younger kids, okay? And this is clearly represented in this figure, right? That we see that there's a, a big shift that um, when we get to like second and third cohort, right? That there's a switch now and that most of the time, more likely than not, they're expressing motion events like rolling down a hill with two um, sequential parts rather than just iconically in one gesture, holistic gesture. Okay. So this is really cool, right? This is a very interesting data suggesting that the structure, right? The, the thisness of language, right? The sequential nature of language is not really due to older adults teaching it to kids, but rather kids are imposing systematic structure on their language, right? So that they can use it with their peers in a productive way. All right. And this is just to state the results very clearly for you, okay? Uh, gestures represent motion events iconically rather than linguistically. The majority of signs, 70%, from cohort one, the older adults, express manner and path simultaneously, which means iconically rather than linguistically. The minority of signs, 30%, from cohort one, older adults, Express, expressed manner and path sequentially, right? Linguistically rather than iconically. On the other hand, the, major, the majority of signs, 70% from cohort three, right? The younger children expressed manner and path simultaneously, okay? So the minority of signs from cohort three expressed manner and path simultaneously. And the majority of signs from cohort three expressed manner and path sequentially. Okay. Main point children largely express motion events sequentially, whereas adults largely express motion events iconically, suggesting that the sequential syntactic structure of NSL is due to children rather than adults. Some other points of emphasis, just rem remember that with gesture, manner and path are integrated by expressing them simultaneously and hol holistically, okay? This is a gesture, okay? It looks like a dog with flappy ears, okay? With sign language or with spoken language, manner and path are segmented and organized sequentially. My dog has floppy ears, right? Sequentially. Singh Iskita and Azuyarik 2004 found that children analyze complex events into basic elements and sequence these elements into hierarchically structured expressions according to principles that were not observed in gestures accompanying speech in the surrounding language. All right. So children create core properties of language. How awesome is that? All right, cool. So now that we've worked our way through one of the main articles for today on NSL, let's go ahead and continue our knowledge of NSL by exploring this second article by Senges and Coppola. Okay, this one's called Children Creating Language, How Nicaraguan Sign Language Acquired a Spatial Grammar. Okay, so what's nice about thinking about these two articles together is that they both focus on NSL, right? So while we have NSL fresh in our mind, let's go ahead and just continue working through this uh, type of language, right? Um, we will further build upon our knowledge of NSL by looking at a different type of linguistic property in this article, 
Okay, so before we were focusing on the nature of motion events, right, like rolling down a hill or being dragged up a mountain or, you know, think of your favorite motion event example, right? In this article, we're focusing on something a little bit different, spatial modulation, okay? So instead of the property of um, focusing on motion events, how we express the motion events, here we're gonna think about how we use spatial modulation to indicate shared reference, okay? And this will make sense as we work through the article. So the purpose of this article is very similar to the previous article, except we're focusing on spatial modulations instead of motion events, okay? And an example of a spatial modulation is provided for you here in figure, uh, the, the really clear example is in B, right? I really like this example because we can see the movement away from the body. Okay, I talk about it more in the next slide, in the next few slides. So in spoken languages, we use grammatical markers such as affixes to indicate linguistic information such as shared reference. However, in sign languages, spatial modulations are used, okay, to communicate this sort of grammatical information. Spatial modulations have been found in all of the world's sign languages, um, but are not used in spoken languages, right? And that should be pretty clear, right? When we're using spoken language, we're using spoken properties to, um, for, um, to modify morphemes and to impose additional um, grammatical information, right? Like if I wanna modify a verb so it's past tense, right, like kick to kicked, right? I can add um, an affix, right, um, uh, to that, right? Which um, I'll apply a, a suffix, right? So it'll be uh, the ed, right, to make it kicked, right? But in, we see that in spoken language, we apply like verbal attachments to add grammatical information, in sign language, we're going to use manuals to do that, right, instead of um, spoken features, clearly, right? And so this is going to be the way that we do, we add grammatical information manually, right, rather than applying uh, an affix, like a prefix, suffix, or infix, right, uh, vocally, we're going to produce a spatial modulation in this case, okay, to add some grammatical information. And the, the grammatical information that we're focusing on for this lecture is uh, shared reference. So like when you pay, if I'm paying somebody and also seeing somebody and that somebody is the same somebody, right? I, I, might, I might be seeing the person that I'm paying, right? Maybe I'm buying some food, right? So I might, uh, see the person, and then I might also pay the person, right? I, must, I might also thank the person or whatever, right? I might do different things to the same person and to indicate things like that, right? Shared reference. I may um, attach some sort of um, vocal or manual marker, okay? All right, another thing that I want us to know, like to understand the nature of spatial modulation in sign language, we need to understand that there's also like a default position, right, in sign languages. And this is somewhat similar to like the default positions or instances of like words, right? Like verbs, for example, right? You got a verb like kick, and then you can do things uh, to it, right? Like you can form a past tense of it, right? You can add additional components to make the word longer, right? Uh, I used, in the last lecture, I used the example of game, the morpheme game. I can add a prefix, pregame. I can add a, a suffix, gamer, right? And we can, given our sort of default or um, neutral entity or item, we can then augment or modify it, okay? And so, the neutral position for signs in um, most sign languages and in NSL is going to be in front of the chest. Okay, so this is going to be the neutral position. Okay, it's also possible to produce signs like um, in different other locations, right? Um, but this is going to be referred to as neutral position. Okay, in front of the chest. 
Okay. And you can sort of see here that there's going to be movements or signs initiated in the center of the body. And then we can move, right, spatially modulate away from that neutral position. Okay. Like here we see that um, in this figure B, we say that this is the sign for pay in NSL, right? And this is produced in a neutral direction and then spatially modulated to the signer's left, okay? And then the sign for C in NSL is provided up here in figure 1A. So in this study, Sengis and Kapala presented participants with an animated cartoon, just like in the previous study, and videotaped them telling its story to appear. Right, this is sort of a nice approach to um, these two studies is let's just play a, a cartoon of some events and then let these participants use their manuals to convey what's going on in these uh, situations, right? And then we can just see whether the signers in the last case were either expressing motion events sequentially or simultaneously. In this case, we wanna see if they're producing spatial modulations or not, okay? So that's what we wanna focus on in this article, okay? So deaf subjects signed their narratives and coders watched the deaf subjects and recorded the number of times that deaf participants used spatial modulations. In the first cohort of older adults, uh, if the first, first cohort of older adults surpasses the second cohort of younger children, in the use of spatial modulations, then we can conclude that individuals with age and experience are responsible for developing the language. However, if the second cohort of younger children surpasses the first cohort of older adults in the use of spatial modulations, then we can conclude that the newest learners are developing the language, going beyond the lang the, their language models, right? Similarly, to the design of the first study in the previous article. Okay. In this article, Singas and Kapala also measured the general fluency rate of children and adults by measuring the number of morphemes that they produced per minute. Okay, so in this article, we wanna understand, um, we can do a couple of things. We wanna, on the one hand, track general fluency, like see if maybe kids or adults or in general, more fluent in NSL, right? And the way that we do that is by annotating the number of morphemes that they produce per minute, right? If I'm more fluent in English or ASL, I'm gonna um, produce more morphemes per minute than you if you're not as fluent in English or ASL, right? So we can use that as a measure of just general fluency, okay? And then we can also just measure the use of spatial modulations um, to indicate a shared reference, right? And that would be tracking not just general fluency with the language, but the use of a particular uh, syntactic structure for grammatical information, right? It would show that they're using spatial modulation specifically for shared reference and not just like producing that sign just more generally, okay? Maybe because they like it or whatever, okay? that it has like their, their increased use is mapped onto its function, okay? So that's what we're interested in this article. Again, we have several cohorts, right? And we should be clear on sort of what we mean by first cohort. Uh, the first cohort, the older group, they were born in 1983 or before. The second cohort was born um, was born after 1983. Yes, okay, so in this group, sorry. Um, the first cohort, here we have two cohorts and then we have early, middle and late exposed groups, okay? So the first cohort was born in 1983 or before, okay? And then the other cohort was born after 1983, okay? Excuse me, so this has to do with age, okay? And then we'll also look at, at exposure to the language and that has to do with exposure at what age they're exposed to NSL. So the early exposed group was first exposed to the deaf community, right? Before six years, six months of age, 
Okay, so this is early exposure to um, the deaf community, early exposure to a community in which they can start to develop science. The middle exposed group was first exposed to the deaf community between six years, six months, and 10 years of age. And the late exposed group was first exposed to the deaf community after 10 years of age. Okay, so those exposed most earliest, right, the deaf community before six, um, six years, six months, the middle group, six years, six months to 10, the late group um, exposed to this community after 10 years of age. All right, now we can look at some of the results. Figure two shows the mean number of spatial modulations per verb produced by early, middle, and late exposed signers of the first and second cohorts. Results from the first analysis in this study showed that early exposed signers produced more spatial modulations compared to late exposed signers. So let's go ahead and look over here on, at the figure right here, right? What do we see? Cohort one, cohort two, right? Cohort one is in the white, cohort two is in the black shaded box, okay? And then here we see early, middle, and late. This represents age at exposure. So we see a couple of things. I want to point out a couple of things in this figure here. One is that we see that early, let's look at early compared to late exposure, right? We see that being exposed to the deaf community earlier, right? Being exposed to other members of a deaf community that you can work together and um, develop a language with, this is going to result in more spatial modulations, right? So the earlier you're exposed to the deaf community, the more spatial modulations you produce, right? And here we see, right, compared to late exposure, we see that if you're exposed to that deaf community after 10, you're producing significantly fewer spatial modulations. So we, here we see an influence of time of exposure right, early versus late on spatial modulation, the use or the production of spatial modulations. So that's one of the things that I wanted to point out here, okay? There's another thing though that is also noteworthy, okay? And that's not comparing early versus late, but comparing cohort one versus to cohort two, okay? We also see here that interestingly enough that the use of spatial modulations is significantly higher for cohort two, right, than for cohort one, right? So what that shows us is that the not the oldest group, like the first uh, uh, class, set of classmates, but the second, right, the subsequent group, they performed better, right? The younger kids, they produced more spatial modulations per verb than the older adults did, or the first cohort, okay? So we see that this is a cool figure. It helps us look at two things. And just to be very clear, we see that early exposure helps with increased spatial modulation compared to late exposure. We also see that being in the second cohort or being the younger group of kids um, also helped increase the use of spatial modulations per verb compared to the older group, right? The older group that was in the first uh, class, okay? The first cohort, okay? And this shows us importantly that both a cohort, whether you're older or younger, as well as age of exposure, whether you're exposed before six and a half years or after 10 years, both of those influence the, your production of spatial modulations, okay? Cool. Uh, this means that those that were exposed to NSL at a younger age produced more spatial modulations or grammatical markers than those that were exposed to NSL at a later age.
All right. Figure three. Uh, this shows the mean number of spatial modulations per verb with non-shared reference uses and shared reference uses. Okay, so here we want to focus on the question is spatial modulation, is that being used just like in general? Am I just doing this because it's fun or for some other reason? Or is it being used specifically to indicate grammatical information, that being shared reference? Okay. We want to know, are kids really increasing their use of this grammatical marker um, for a specific grammatical function, or are they just producing it more generally, right? It may fall out of just general, more general fluency is another way to think about that, right? If I'm just way more fluent in NSL, then I'm probably going to produce everything more, right? What we, we care about, though, is for this syntax, right, and whether the spatial modulation is, um, we want to see um, whether younger versus older, and also the, the age of exposure influences this distinction between non-shared reference uses and shared reference uses. All right, and if you go ahead and look with me on these two figures, A and B, we see that figure B looks very similar in some sense to this figure here, right? And this is showing us that for shared reference uses, there is a distinction between cohort one and cohort two, as well as a distinction between early and late exposure, right? Excuse me. So this is just to reiterate, actually, this is just to restate exactly what we stated here, that sort of, um, the, the distinction that we see between cohort one and two and the distinction we see between early and late is in some sense replicated down here for shared reference uses, okay? So results from the second analysis showed that the second cohort of signers, right, the younger children, we're increasingly using spatial modulations for the particular function of indicating spatial reference, okay? So again, we see that the cohorts, one versus two, are indicated by the, the distinction between white versus black colored um, boxes here in this figure, okay? And we see that cohort two is significantly higher on this y-axis than cohort one, right? Where the y-axis shows modulations per verb, right? For shared reference uses, okay? So we see that yes, being a younger uh, person, being a younger child, as opposed to an older adult, as a younger child, I'm gonna produce more spatial modulations for shared reference uses, okay? Keep this in mind when we look up top now for figure A, we see that that distinction no longer is, is no longer there for non-shared reference uses, okay? So we see here that the, importantly, cohort two, the kids, they're not just increasing spatial modulations in general for any purpose, right? Or we would, we would see an increase here also, right? What we're seeing importantly is this, B, that their increase in use of spatial modulation is for this grammatical purpose rather than like a general purpose, okay? And that's what the distinction between figure A and figure B shows is that for shared reference uses down here in B, right, for the grammatical uses, that's where we're getting the distinction. Okay, but for um, non-shared reference uses, the distinction between cohorts in some sense dissolves, okay? So I hope that that's clear for everybody, okay? So again, up here for A, for non-shared reference uses, there's no difference on that, whether you're in cohort one or cohort two. And there's no difference in that, whether you're exposed early or middle, eh, right? There's a little 
thing going on here, right? Uh, that we got to look into, but you see that this looks rather non eventful, whereas here we get more meaningful results, okay? And also here, these asterisks are supposed to indicate significant results, okay? So we see there's no significant difference here or here. Here we're seeing some significance, okay? So for shared reference uses, we see that cohort one and cohort two differ from each other. And also there's a difference between early exposure and late exposure, okay? All right, very cool. I think this stu these studies are really fun. All right, this figure shows morphemes per minute, right? For early, middle and late exposed signers of the first and second cohorts. And remember that uh, we wanted to track morphemes per minute to track general uh, fluency, okay? And results from this analysis showed that fluency was generally greater for early exposed signers than for late exposed signers, okay? Well, this is somewhat unsurprising, right? That those that are exposed to their language earlier uh, are more fluent and they demonstrate their greater fluency by producing more instances, meaningful instances per minute, okay? So what do we see here? The younger kids are much more fluent than the older adults, okay? And early exposure to a language results in greater fluency than late exposure to the language, okay? That's how we look at these figures. So those that were exposed to NSL at a younger age produced more morphemes per minute, thereby demonstrating greater general fluency with NSL than those that were exposed to NSL at a later age. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap up the main points of the study. So the main purpose of this study, Sangus and Coppola examined the prevalence and function of newly emerging spatial devices over two cohorts of learners to determine whether grammatical systematicity in NSL has come from children or adults. The main finding from the study, results from the study indicate that a grammatical systematicity in NSL comes from the children, not the adults. Notice, however, that results from this study suggest that it took several subsequent cohorts to grammaticize NSL. Okay, and we sort of seen that through these two studies. This is not happening overnight or within a single cohort, right? But that there's a sort of over subsequent generations, right? Over several subsequent cohorts, they sort of collectively work to impose new grammatical or syntactic structures on their sign languages. Importantly, the study showed that the second cohort of younger children did not simply reproduce the language as it was produced to them by the first cohort of older adults, but rather the children changed the language as they learned it. So once again, we find that children create core properties of language. And I hope you find this uh, really fascinating and highly relevant to our studies in cognitive science, right? We've been sort of focusing on the first two weeks on this debate between empiricism and nativism. And I want you to think about how these studies influence that debate, okay? Of course, we've also been urging, um, we, I've been urging you to adopt a more nuanced view and not think strictly in terms of extremes, like purely innate or purely from experience, but also we wanna think along a developmental timeline and start, start to plot our knowledge and the skills, the cognitive skills and capacities that we develop over time, okay? So thank you so much for your attention today. And I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our next lecture.